As a part of our new Cornell Cooperative Extension Marine Program's digital education initiative, we have started a new video and audio podcast series called Cornell Marines Digital Learning Podcast. This is our third show, and if you haven't seen our first two shows, check them out. We're, we focused on the world of alewives, an important fish spawning in our local waters, and the second show was all about clams, and we touched on the Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project. My name is Rory McNish, and I am CCE Program's Marine Media Specialist. This week's show, we're going to focus on a fish many people are surprised to find out lives in our local waters. Good morning, Mr. C. How did your clam chowder, chowder turn out? Hey, good morning, Rory. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. How did your clam chowder turn out? Turned out great. There's not a drop left. Pretty tasty, even though I use canned clams. Hey, listen, I think we should thank Josh again for giving us a tour of uh, the hatchery and telling us about the uh, Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project. Yeah, I agree. Uh, he was great. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed uh, listening to him. I learned a lot. Uh, I didn't know that he was so into fishing. Oh, my gosh. It was crazy. Yeah, I've done some porgy fishing with my sons and actually my nephews uh, last, last uh, summer. We had a blast out on the uh, Long Island Sound. All right, I've got a surprise for you. Check this photo out. You see it? Wow. <laughs> Where did you get that photo? That was a what, few years what, back. You got to tell me a little bit about it. That's why I have it because, you know, we share an we used to share an office together, but uh, I got my ways. <laughs> well, that was a really nice striper I caught uh, that day. We had some uh, blue fish. And actually, my son caught this large fluke uh, that the boat captain uh, called it a doormat because of its size. All right. I've heard of, I've heard of the doormat before. I don't think I've ever caught one, but... Uh, my neighbor caught a doormat a while ago. All right, Mr. C, this week we are focusing on a fish again, like we did the first week about the alewife. And uh, this week we have a strange looking but loved fish many people don't realize that are in our local waters. All right. Uh, I'm kind of clueless at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to let me in on the secret, Rory? All right, I'll give you a clue. The fish has a tail but not a tail you would think when you think of a fishtail. Huh. Well, uh, that clue's not helping me very much. Uh, I still don't know. Okay, here's a better clue. Kim Manzo. Ah, now I get it. This week's show is about seahorses. And we're going to have Kim, Kim on as a special guest because she's our uh, Cornell Marine Program uh, seahorse expert. Cornell Marine Program has been working over the years with replanting eelgrass beds that are critical habitat for our local marine life, including seahorses. Kim Manzo, who works in the Habitat Program, has also been looking into our local seahorse populations. Mark, I think it's time we contact Kim and see if she can get on board here and share what she's been learning and what she's been doing with seahorses. I think that's a great idea, Rory. Let's do it. Good morning, Kim. Good morning, guys. How are you? Doing good. How you doing? Doing great. How's a beautiful the beautiful uh, sunny day? Yeah, it's a nice sunny day, isn't it? How you been doing with the uh, all the stay-at-home stuff? I'm doing pretty well. You know, I'm home with my two daughters. I'm um, getting lots of quality time, and all I right, am good. Truly That's appreciate good. their teachers right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's Absolutely. for sure. I, I like your picture in the background, Kim. Thank you. <laughs> now, yeah, did you I have a lot of seahorse art around the house. Did you I draw that? that? No, I did not. I can't, All right. can't I did. I'm not, I'm not the best artist, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't even draw a straight line, Kim. So anybody can draw a seahorse like that. And they have my admiration. Yeah, and I can only take I a agree. picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kim, let, uh, let's get jump right into it. Um, how did you get interested in working with seahorses? I actually got interested in them when I saw them for the first time in the wild. So I work for the Habitat program at Cornell Collaborative Extension. And one of the main things we do is we restore seagrass. Um, actually, our local species of seagrass called eelgrass. And 
There was one time when I was out checking on a planting site and I happened to see a seahorse in the wild and it was just absolutely amazing. And from then I've been hooked. I just wow. had to learn more about them. That's great. So you actually were out scuba diving when you saw the seahorses, right, Kim? Yes. So in order to plant our, our eelgrass and to monitor it, to see how the plantings are doing, we need to use scuba. Um, so yeah, I, I've seen a lot of seagrass and a lot of amazing creatures while diving in seagrass, but um, it, it was in 2008 that I first saw a seahorse in the wild. And since then, I've been obsessed with them. And honestly, it, they are the perfect ambassador for the eelgrass program because they love seagrass. So they really are- I'm gonna are share a image um, of a seahorse. Can you see that? So Kim, what are those like, little feather-like things on the head sure. and the back of the seahorse. Those are called siri, and those are actually just little appendages that seahorses can grow to help them camouflage. Um, skin, but depending on the environment that they're living in, um, they can grow extra long siri to kind of blend in and look like seaweed or seagrass. So an adult seahorse necessarily doesn't have longer ones, right? Right. No, it doesn't have to do with their age or their size. Um, it has more to do with them helping to camouflage themselves in whatever environment they're living in. So can you explain why their tail is so special and what they use it for, Kim? Absolutely. I, would, I think that their, their tail makes them probably more unique than any other fish when you first look at them. You know, at first appearance, that's probably the first thing you notice is that, that tail, that curly tail. And that's known as a prehensile tail, same as the monkey. So they use that tail as another appendage, and they use it to hang on um, to seagrasses or whatever, um, you know, structure they're hanging on to. Um, another thing that you immediately notice when you look at a seahorse is they have a long snout. So seahorses, they can't open their mouth big and wide like a lot of fish can, they have to be able to find food that can fit into their tiny little mouths. So the food that they eat depends on how big they are and, and how large their, their mouth is, basically. So Kim, didn't you have some seahorses give birth at the Marine Center? Yes, I did. I used to raise seahorses for several years and um, it was, it was an awesome experience, and I actually learned a lot and got pretty good at it, I should say. But one of the um, advantages I had was the, our Marine Center in South Pole is located right on the bay, and also we had access to the creek behind our lab, and I was able to catch wild food for the seahorses every day. So it was a lot of, of work, um, but the seahorses did really well because they had real live food. Now I'm going to uh, share a video uh, of a seahorse giving birth. Um, let's check that out. Uh, let's see. Hold on one second. Uh, here we go. There you go. Ah, I'll make away. that a little bigger. <gasps> Why are you swimming right in the way? <laughs> Get out of here. Maybe she's protecting him. Oh, look. Wow, they're That's all so cool. Out. Oh, there they are. Isn't that crazy? There they go. Oh my God! Oh. Amazing. So that is a great shot of those seahorse babies being born, Kim. How many uh, babies would a, an adult male have? So an adult male can have hundreds of babies at a at a time. It usually ranges between 100 and 600 or so babies can be born at one time. Wow, that is a lot. That's amazing. Here's another image. Pretty cool stuff. Yes, so right from birth, seahorses are basically just little mini replicas of their parents. Yeah, they look exactly they, the they same. Their prey. Yeah, they look exactly the same. A lot of, you know, fish when they're first born, they look very different from what the adult fish would look like, but seahorses are almost tiny little replicas of their parents. And they could change color as soon as they're born. So if you notice in, a, in some of these photos that you're seeing, 
they, there's some that are a little yellow or brown or black, and they can actually change color from day one when they're first born. Pretty cool. Wow. So what do you have to feed the babies, Kim? Obviously, they eat different food than the adults since they're so small. Yes. So seahorses, in general, they eat um, crustaceans, but they have to eat crustaceans that are small enough to fit into their little snout because they don't have a jaw that can open really wide. So when they're first born, they eat some of the smallest crustaceans that are called copepods. You might have heard of them before. They're a very common zooplankton. And as they grow older, um, they can feed on slightly larger um, crustaceans. So they move on to small amphipods and even shrimp as they get older. That's wonderful. Wow, that's neat. Uh, Kim, I heard this. I don't know if it's true, but I have to ask you. I heard somewhere that seahorses actually don't even have a real stomach. Is that true? That's true. Their, their stomach is, is really more just like a long tube. So it's not very efficient, which means that seahorses have to constantly eat to make sure that they're getting enough nutrients and they have enough energy to survive. So seahorses spend all their time pretty much looking for food or socializing. They're also pretty social. Kim, how many uh, species of seahorse are in the world? Rory, there's about 45 species of seahorses around the world, although they do, they have found a few new species recently. Wow, maybe you could discover one and have one named after you. <laughs> that would be a dream come true. And what's the most amazing experience you've had so far? Well, this is tough. But I would say probably the first time I saw a, a seahorse give birth, that was extremely exciting. And I feel like not very many people have witnessed this before. Kim, can you tell us about the state of seahorses in the world today and locally? Maybe start with the local issue. So seahorses are becoming more rare locally. And the main reason for that is because we don't have a lot of their favorite habitat left, eelgrass. Um, Cornell Cooperative Extension has been working on eelgrass restoration for many years. So we are doing our part to help seahorses and other marine life in that way. Um, but this issue is actually a worldwide problem. We're losing our seagrasses all over the world. And for that reason, seahorses around the world are also in trouble because of habitat loss. Isn't there another issue, Kim, that people are actually harvesting seahorses in other parts of the world? Unfortunately, Seahorses are harvested for something called traditional Chinese medicine. There are people who believe that they have some um, medical properties to them and they actually eat them. The problem is that as seahorses become more and more rare, they only become more and more valuable in the traditional Chinese medicine market and in other black markets like the curio trade, which is another thing that threatens our seahorses. Some people like to take them home as souvenirs, hmm. but um, fortunately it's affecting their population. Well, that's a shame. It's really sad to hear that. But maybe you could take a seahorse home as a pendant. I heard you're working with an artist to make uh, seahorse jewelry. Yes, that's right, Mark. So we teamed up with a local jewelry maker known as Mana Maid, and she actually created a seahorse pendant necklace that's made from a real seahorse. So back when I was raising seahorses, um, you know, they didn't all survive, which is normal. You know, they have hundreds of babies because they hope that a few of them will survive, right? So when I was raising them, I did have some mortality and I had a few dried seahorses in my collection, um, mostly for keeping track of how big they were and things like that. And I donated a few to her because she wanted to try making a cast. And she was actually able to make this beautiful cast. And now she can um, make seahorse necklaces in a variety of different finishes. And she actually donates the proceeds to us. So you can go ahead and purchase a seahorse necklace if you want to to help out the seahorse conservation initiative. I'll put that, uh, any kind of links or anything uh up so people can know where to go uh, uh, with that. Now, Kim, what, in what ways are you still involved with uh, seahorses today now? So we started something called the Seahorse Conservation Initiative, 
And basically, this is just a way for us to try to learn more about our local seahorse populations so that we can take that information and provide it to people that might be able to help seahorses. Um, one of the aspects of this, this um, project is to monitor for seahorses in our local seagrass beds. These past two summers, I was able to get groups of volunteers to come out with me and to search for seahorses um, by seining through a seagrass bed. If and when we find one, which is very rare, but it, it does happen, we can record some useful information about the seahorse and we can log it into a database called iSeahorse. And this actually can help um, managers around the world to learn more about where seahorses are located and um, what areas need to be protected to make sure that um, you know, we help conserve our seahorse population. That's awesome. Um, and that will all continue, hopefully, when we, uh, we get through this pandemic and uh, things start to open up for us again, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's all, all still pending. Well, I want to say thank you so much for your time and your expertise in the uh, seahorse area. And uh, it's amazing stuff. I mean, it's, it, we, we kind of miss, uh, you know, having that right there at the, at the Marine Center, you know, to go check them out or whatever, you know. But you haven't been doing it too much even the, the past uh, six months or so, like through, the, through this winter? Um, I have one seahorse currently because, you know, I'm a mom now <laughs> of actual children, not only seahorse children. So I had to tone down the amount of uh, seahorse raising I was doing. <laughs> right, right, right. So yeah, you mentioned high maintenance. The, yeah, oh, I can imagine. Um, well, you also said about the collecting of the food and everything at the Marine Center, you know, it's, uh, it's a difficult thing to get all that. And so now you're, it's even harder. Now you mentioned the eelgrass work. Um, maybe you can give us an idea um, about the uh, eelgrass initiatives that Cornell has that you've been working on. Yes, thank you, Rory. You're welcome. So some people might be wondering what they can do to help seahorses. You know, what Cornell is doing and what we're inviting you to join us to do is to help our local seagrass population. Um, so one thing you could do is to learn about our local seagrass called eelgrass. You could teach people about it. And um, you can, you can um, see if Cornell is posting any events related to marine meadows. So this is our program where we invite volunteers to come help us to restore eelgrass. Now with um, the whole COVID-19 going on, we'll have to stay tuned about that. Usually right. we have these events in the spring and in the fall. So okay. at this point, let's stay tuned for the fall for Marine Meadows events. Um, and if not, we might have to hold off till next year. But in the meanwhile, we can all learn a little bit about seagrass and why it's important and what species rely on it. Well, we can try to teach our families friends about it. We'll probably talk about eelgrass more uh, with the, uh, the Cornell Digital Learning Initiative that we're doing here. So uh, maybe we'll invite you back and maybe Steve Schott, if we can get him on camera. I don't know about uh -huh. that. That would be fun, you know. So, well, yeah. cool. I, I just want to thank you for, you know, your passion for this animal. And uh, it's just been amazing listening to, you know, some of the, the different things that you're involved with with them. You know, it's been great. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to say, Kim, thank you very much. I learned more about seahorses today. They sure are amazing creatures, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have you on again and, uh, with another update. That sounds great. Thank you so much for having me on. All right. Well, we'll, we'll see you again then. All yep. right. Yep. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. Next week, we're going to be talking about water quality. Now, Mark, isn't that a topic that you're, uh, you're into too? I know it's not sharks, but I also know you've done a lot of work with Suffolk County on stormwater issues. Yeah, that's right, Rory. Uh, since 2005, uh, we've been working with the county, uh, working on their stormwater management program. Now, are we going to have a guest for next week? I don't know. I guess we'll have to figure that one out. All right. Well, next week's guest is going to be a surprise then. So um, maybe it'll be uh, Scott Curtola Wegman. Maybe he'll yeah. join us or... Maybe uh, let's get it. Let's try to get somebody from uh, the west end of uh, of Suffolk County. How's that? Yeah, sounds good. We'll see what happens. It's a mystery for next week. So take care, Mark. 
You too, Roy. Have a great night. You too. This podcast is a part of a digital learning initiative here at Cornell Cooperative Extension Marine Program. If you want more information and more materials, please go to our website at www.ccesuffolk.org forward slash marine. Look for our digital education initiative link on the lower left part of the page. As I looked yesterday, there's more like references to the digital learning page as well. So if you go there, you'll definitely see it. Now we've been putting together some teacher and student resources, art initiatives, quizzes, and some really good and informative videos. So see you next time on Cornell Marine's Digital Learning Podcast.